Hello, and welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. This is the video version of our audio podcast, which you can find wherever you listen to podcasts. But of course, you are watching the video version, so welcome. This is where I speak to some of the most incredible performers, artists, singers, musicians of our time. And my guest today needs almost no introduction on YouTube. He is the multi-talented, multi-instrumentalist Jacob Collier. Jacob blew people away with his one-man band cover songs as a teenager. Now, five albums and five Grammys later, Jacob's collaborating with A-listers and even conducting 30,000 people audience choirs. Plus, you'll hear Jacob's thoughts on where creativity comes from. I think everybody inherently has in them something that wants to live desperately. And I feel like there's never a point where it's too late to kindle that force. And a behind-the-scenes look at his star-studded album, Jesse, Volume 4. So I, I, I messaged him like, hey, T-Pain, man, like, what's up? You know, he was like, oh, Jacob, and I'm, I'm, I'm such a fan, whatever. And I was just so blown away. Then he just crushed it. It was so amazing. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Jacob Collier. Jacob, thanks, thanks so much for, for jumping on. Let's talk a little bit about, about your, I mean, you, you were born and raised in London. And mm. it happens that you, were, you grew up in a musical family. Your mom is a musician. So I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, that from an early age, I mean, you were, you were listening to her play the violin at home. Do you know my earliest memory that I can remember from my, not only from my musical life, but from my human existence is actually sitting about where I'm sitting right now, which is in this little corner of this little room, which I adore in London. And I would sit on my mother's lap while she was playing the violin above me. And I would look up and see the violin. It was like, it was the ceiling above my head. And like this resonant singing ceiling. And um, that memory kind of, I mean, it just, it went so deep for me. It goes wow. so deep for me still. And yeah, it was it was kind of a, a a bit of a second language growing up, I guess, for me. An avid listener, avid player, avid singer, um, and you know, all, all of my family are, you could say, sort of introverts, but have deep inner worlds. And I think all of us have found um, music to be a very, very valuable and rich companion to all stages of life, right from the very, very beginnings to the to, to the to the present moment. And I'm really lucky to have had that access to not just the, the the breadth of music, but just the kind of curiosity about music. Like, how does this work? Why do I feel like this when I hear this chord or this sound? You know, why? How does the how is the energy controlled? And you know, what what are the human beings trying to say? And all these different axes at play. I, I loved the, the whole process. I loved. Um, I'm, I was surprised, I, and I, I it may be wrong, but I, from what I gather, you didn't actually take music lessons until later on. You took singing lessons. Is that That's right? That's true. That is true. You're, you're bang on. Um, yeah, the one thing I had formal training with before the age of about 16, 15, 16, was the voice. Um, turns out that's quite a good thing to learn how to control. You know, you learn how to breathe properly, which helps your whole life. You learn how to yeah. stand properly, um, how to project, and uh, all these different things. But at the rest of it, I really, yeah, I kind of, I picked it up as I went along and I was very interested in how to be a bass player or how to be a drummer and how to be a piano player. And I didn't know these things officially, you know, there was no qualifications that I had other than my deep interest. And I had a microphone, it was a very, very simple microphone called an SM58 microphone by Sure. And sure, it's a classic, like, microphone Classic, like used, the, yeah. you'd find it in yeah. any jam session in the world. Yes. And... A little computer, which is about where this computer is that I'm looking at your face into now, and I, I, yeah, I would, I would, I would layer up these different sounds to imitate and replicate the things I was hearing in the world around me. So, lots of different vocals and harmonies, the way they can layer up, and and eventually, you know, more instruments and, and things like that too. But yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was lucky to have this space. I st still am very lucky to have this space. I, I want to go back to instruments for a moment because, given that your mom is a professional violinist. We'll talk about this later because she performs with you and is recorded with you. Yeah. But she was a professor at the Royal Academy. Your, I, I guess your her grandfather or your grandfather was My also grandfather. Yeah, a violinist sure. who taught at the Royal Academy. So this is quite a pedigree. And yet your mom didn't push instruments on you, didn't make you or or encourage you to learn an instrument as a, as a like a two-year-old or a three-year-old. No, it wasn't like that at all, which I... I... I'm so deeply grateful for, I can't tell you, that the number of people I've met, friends of mine or or fans of mine who have said, you know, I, 
I did love music when I was really young, and then I was forced to play the piano every day by this like titan of a teacher, and I <laughs> fell out of love, and it's just so yeah. sad. But yeah. yeah, my my mom is a yeah she's a she's a really her mind is just wide open, um, and yeah to me I, I I do remember being handed a violin when I was about two, and it was kind of like this is a violin, one of many friends that you may make in this world, and we kind of got along a bit me and the violin. But by the time I was four, I think I kind of. I think me and the violin had had reached our tenure. It was it was time to move on. Uh, I, I don't think I quite had the patience for it because yeah. with the violin, you know, it takes you could argue many years to make one note sound beautiful on the violin. It can take a number of years of experience and patience and listening. And I think as a child, I, I wanted more immediate results, but, but perhaps I wanted something to go whiz or bang when I hit it. And um, so I, I I kind of gravitated towards yeah the, the voice, which is inherent for all of us, but also the piano, which what is. You- yeah, yeah, sorry. What no, you, no, no, no. Go ahead. What do you? There's a bit of a delay sometimes. So I'm sorry. What do you remember about wanting to learn how to sing? We've we've had pop singers on the show. Like I, I can think of like Ellie Goulding or mm. Jason Derulo, who from from as long as I can remember, they were singing. Or you know, even Shania Twain from from yeah from their t- in Jewel from the time they were three, <laughs> show tunes or you know, or pop songs. I mean. Were you and there's a definitely a certain type of kid who's like that. I mean, I know mm. that you've described yourself as an introvert and as somebody who was more sort of quieter. But I wonder, were you that were you that kind of kid who was just always singing in the house and mm-hmm. singing in the shower, or or was it just something that I don't know? You kind of came to in a in a different way. It's actually a really interesting question. I I definitely wasn't a theatre kid in that sense. I I didn't parade myself about or exaggerate my behaviour for others. I I think I exaggerated inwards, perhaps. So I would would feel a lot of things vividly and I would seek ways of explaining them. And I, I don't think I ever identified as, you know, having this dream of standing on a stage and being like, man, I'm going to sing. I know the whole crowd was going to be there. It's going to be amazing. I think I thought more, you know, I I want to like craft stuff that I care about. Um, didn't really matter whether it was with the voice or whether it was with the piano or anything else. Um, sometimes it wasn't with music at all. But I think the the idea that I could I could be a, a craftsman, I think that appealed to me a great deal more than being a showman. And the funny thing about that is that when I began my, you could say sort of quote unquote career about 10 years ago and started to share it, the, the early videos that you mentioned on, on YouTube, sort of multi-instrumental, multi-vocal, harmonizations of things to now I'm about to release this fifth album of mine um mm. I've fallen so deeply in love with playing on stage that I almost don't recognize the version of myself uh-huh. who would rather who would rather stay indoors um you know I began my live performance journey with a one man show I toured with a one man show for about 3 years that was what I performed with at TED that year in, in 2017 when you yeah. were there and um yeah that whole era was fascinating because it was the first time I'd ever kind of a- attempted that that thing yeah. of standing on a stage and sharing ideas and and building grooves and and making a, val- a valuable experience for people and the the yeah I guess the now seven nearly seven years since that since that moment of 2017 um my yeah my my sort of soul and um mind have just kind of become so much more open to what the world can feel like when you say hey I'm on a stage but I'm not necessarily in command here like I I, I revere my audiences. I think they're wonderful, and I, I they're, they're they're very much a part of the band in my performances. And I think that that's that's a part of the the journey that I've been on, and I'm still on to kind of find that level of of uh, of joy and 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 comfort, you know, on on stage. But it's it's a wonderful feeling, and and uh, now I would say is the time I've most identified as the person who loves that. When I was two or three, I just like to like put all my marbles in symmetrical order and stay indoors, yeah. you know. When when you were taking lessons, right, and, and you come from a country with a rich tradition of like boys choirs, right? Mm, like definitely, you know. And and was that the kind of singing that you that you were learning how to do? Yeah, actually, Ooh, like super pure and. Yeah, Gla- glassy. You could say, like, not so much like, ah! not that kind of thing. More like, Ooh, yeah. you know, and, churchy um, cathedrals. You, you could say, yeah, cathedralic or something, c- c- cathedral. I suppose you'd say. <laughs> um, 
yeah, there's something about the, the voice of a young boy that hangs in a cathedral that's really haunting, really kind of tender and moving, fragile yet strong. Um, that, that There's a whole lineage of music that was composed for that kind of voice. And um, yeah, I was really lucky to find my way into, the, into that scene. And um, at that age was just like mind blown by the kinds of options that I that, that were available to some of those some, some of the composers of, of those times. Um, and yeah, I, I came into the sort of, you know, I guess you could say singing more populist song type stuff much later on. Uh, it's it's all the same technique, you know, it's all the same breathing and projecting and resonance and stuff like that. But uh, I think I was interested, I you know, I'm always kind of proud of being English and being, yeah, as you say, from a country filled with such legends, you know, people like William Byrd and Thomas Tallis and all these like just absolute titans of of choral music, you could say, and and I have always so deeply loved the idea of the human voice and the potential it has to lift and augment life. And so I think I had first-hand experience as a kid of that exact feeling. And there's nothing like singing in a cathedral. There's just nothing like that feeling. I don't I don't know if you've ever done it, but it's just an amazing feeling. I, I, I'm interested in how how instruments entered your life because from from what I gather, it wasn't a formal process. It was like you used your voice to figure, you knew the sounds that your voice could make because a voice is an instrument and you wanted to figure out how you could replicate or sort of, you know, approximate those vocal sounds with an instrument. I guess starting with a Casio keyboard. How, how do you know this stuff? Um, this is very, very true. I wanted to find the edge of my voice. Uh, and as a child, the edge of your voice is like, because that's like your lowest note, you know? Yeah. Um, and then gradually that increases. But, you know, I, my attitude to creativity in general was I will use the things I have around me, whatever they are, to make things I care about. And I didn't have a bunch of instruments growing up, really. I had the, the family piano, which was like one of my dearest companions. And I had, I think there was a guitar that came into my life, that one up, up there, actually, which when I was about 13. Um, I think I, I found my way into, a, into the hands of a bass when I was about 14. Or so, but but really, a lot of it was like saucepans and spoons, and like I've got this basket of spoons right here that I still use as a shaker slash hi hat, and this is just filled with my grandfather's cutlery, you know. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, I think for me, it was it wasn't so much a bunch of instruments. It was it was the idea that you don't. I didn't have a I didn't have a huge amount to create with, but I had a massive appetite for creativity. And the one thing I always had was my voice. So I would use my voice to. Yeah, you could say recreate sounds of instruments I didn't have, like like trumpets and trombones and flutes and clarinets or whatever it happened to be, to try and make the sound bigger. And the amazing thing about that Casio keyboard, um, and I think anyone who's listening to this who has ever had, either had a child who's played with Casio keyboards or been one of those children themselves, it's it's a joyous uh, occasion for the child. It could be very, probably very irritating for those surrounding the child at times. But, you know, a, a Casio keyboard or a keyboard of any brand contains within it say like 100 rhythms and 200 sounds. And so the rhythms might be kind of like bossa nova or reggae or poker or yeah. you know, rock and roll. And then there's, there's a bunch of presets and it's kind of like, it kind of approximates the, the genre. And then the sounds, you know, filled with all sorts of interesting things I'd never seen, like a tubular bell, I'd never seen that, or a, a Appalachian mountain dulcimer. Like what even is that? I have no idea, but I know what it sounds like. It sounds like, you know, on the keyboard. So I think I, I've always been kind of um, proud and grateful for the time in which I grew up because it was a time where access to ingredients or co creative components was was on the rise. I think it's been exponentially on the rise since I first touched a musical instrument. There's been a greater and great, increasingly greater amount of access um, to sounds and, and the world of sculpting them in, in a way that I have really, really enjoyed. So when I kind of, you could say, graduated from my little Casio keyboard to Logic, which is like a, one of the many um, audio softwares that we musicians can use to record. Logic was a bit like a Casio keyboard on steroids. You know, it contained like tons more sounds than I'd ever even imagined. All these orchestral instruments and and drum sounds and all sorts of stuff. So I really enjoyed the process of kind of learning firsthand by touching all these materials. Like, what can this stuff mean? What can it do? And joining the dots between things I heard on CDs or heard on the radio, whatever, growing up. And I'd, I'd recreate my own version of that for fun and that's that was end up being a very valuable way of me learning some of those early ropes you know um as you you sort of began to gain recognition for your your singing abilities you you were in some some theater you were in theater and some even some films i saw you 
you can find this on YouTube. You're you're portraying Tiny Tim in a in a television um, version of a Christmas Carol that came out in 2004. It's amazing. But <laughs> yeah. I wonder how how much of a voice, right? Of of you learning how to use your voice and how to control it. Mm. How much of that it becomes a skill that you can actually really work with, and how much of that is just what you're gifted with, like mm. your range, your whether your voice is good or not. I mean, you know, is it is is somebody like you? And this is maybe a hard question for you to answer, but maybe a critic would be better to answer the question. But like. Were you good at at singing because you naturally mm. had a good voice, or because you were really determined to figure out like how to stretch all of the different ways you could use it? It's a really interesting question. Um, I think I think the question it begs in return is how you would define good, um, and this is actually something I think a lot about as a creative person because you can define good in many ways. Um, it's risky in some ways to define something as objectively good. Uh, David Byrne, who's one of my favorite singers of all time, who many you could argue would would say he's is one of the, one of the least qualified singers in the world. Um, he 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 said this beautiful thing once, which I'll never forget, which is the better the singer's voice, the more difficult it is for me to understand what they're singing about. <laughs> um, which I just think is so so marvelous because you know sometimes you have these very pristine, well trained voices, maybe theater voices or operatic voices or pop voices, whatever, any kind of voice, jazz voice. And if the technique is good enough, like so good, uh, it, then it can get to the point where you can't feel what's behind the voice and, and you can't discern any of those imperfections. You can't relate to the voice in any way. Um, and I think the funny thing about my training and my priorities as a composer and artist is I never really thought of myself as a singer. You know, In the same way, I never really thought of myself as a piano player or a bass player or a clarinetist or anything. I just thought of myself as a musician, you know, someone who loves music and wants to make music. So I think for me, my voice became a part of my palette. Um, I never really tried to be a really, really great kind of say pop singer or jazz singer, but I loved and continue to love absorbing from all these different worlds and ways you can sing as a as a singer and, and just kind of combining all that stuff in ways that I find interesting. And, you know, in the last few years, I've collaborated with like over a hundred different different musicians for this sort of ever sprawling album cycle I've been working on and have almost completed. And um, every one of them has their own voice, you know, and it's just been such a privilege to get to learn firsthand from all these different kinds of voices, whether it's Chris Martin or Stormzy or Shawn Mendes to Rhapsody or Tori Kelly, um, Uma Sangari from Mali or um, Hamid al Kasri from Morocco. You know, every, every one of these types of voices, the timbre voice is so different that if there's one thing I know for certain, it's that it's impossible to say, well, this is a good singer and this singer, this is a bad singer, because yeah. it just depends where you come from. It depends what your priorities are. It depends who you're singing for, if you're singing for anybody. Um, and I think that, yeah, I've, some of my favorite moments recording vocals and performing vocals are the moments where I'm the least, perhaps I'm the least refined. Um, and I think that's, that again, is a little bit of a paradox about the idea that you know, you're trained to be good uh, at things and you should be as good as you can. And the idea that you're good if you're refined or you're perfect, I think is is not only really slightly misguided, but it can be very unhelpful for anybody who's trying to make a thing. Yeah. How did you get to that place, right? Because you were trained and then you went to a high, a high school that was for performing artists. And there is a level of performance and trying to you know hit what this notion of what it means to be perfect or near perfect. And and it just reminds me of this interview I did many years ago with a, a TED speaker and well, he's a famous neuroscientist named Charles Lim. Mm -hmm. And he brings jazz musicians and performers into a, an fMRI. I've seen, asks, I think I've, I've seen some of this you stuff. You see, yeah. right? And he asks yeah. them to perform and he finds that their, their creative, their creativity or what, what we think we can measure as creativity in the brain is just firing on all cylinders when they're less worried about making mistakes. Yeah, and yeah, they're yeah. just, they're, they're, you know, they're less sort of worried about being judged. And I wonder how you got to this place of, you know, being on stage as a kid, being in, in some television, singing uh, w with your peers to a place where you could you know, you could really experiment and you didn't have to worry or you felt like you didn't have to worry so much about whether you were sounding the way you thought you should sound. Yeah, it's a great question. Such, such, such an important question. I, I will say I I definitely struggled um, 
at school and in in and around some of those things I did as a child to find that feeling. Uh, and I think it's because school. I mean, it's a weird, it's a weird old place. School. I think it's, it's certainly for anybody who is creatively inclined. Um, you know, I went to a, a very ordinary uh, in UK. We we call them secondary school. So from the age of eleven to fifteen, I was surrounded by kind of every different kind of person you can imagine. Um, not not remotely a music school, but a school filled with all sorts of different kinds of people. And then the last two years of my schooling, I went to uh, the school that I think you you mentioned, which is called the Purcell School, which is for young young musicians. And in neither in neither environment did I feel like I really found my people. It wasn't it wasn't so much like oh I you know you you perform you perform on stage so I can relate to you or you know you are. Um, you know, you, you you play sports, or you're interested in say you're interested in soccer. You know, like that wasn't that wasn't necessarily the, the place where I found my where I found my people. I, I had a, du- a dual existence, you could say, in in the school situation where the school system was very kind of liturgical and straight lines and discipline oriented, and you have a detention if you do the wrong thing and all this kind of stuff. To my home environment, which, as I sort of previously mentioned, was just so much more capacious for um, kind of like whatever feels right is right. And um, the the balance, I think, in my life between those two forces is very interesting and something I've thought a lot about um, over the years. And it wasn't really till I left the school system that I really feel, I feel like I found that feeling of, oh, so the best thing I can be for this audience is not the thing that they, I think they want me to be. It's actually just me the way I am, you know, and... um, and I think you know I'm I'm still I'm still learning learning that feeling now, and and I'm very grateful for every opportunity I get to explore it. Um, but I I think that the world is you know it's an, it's an exaggerated world of judgment right now. You have these interesting apertures. You've got the internet. You've got social media. You've got yeah. Um, even AI, you know, which it itself is is sort of inherently built to exaggerate existing forms. And I think it's a it's a bizarre time to find confidence. Because I think that certain parts of confidence come from, um, it, yeah, you could say not conforming to, or not trying to conform to one idea of right or wrong. Uh, I definitely know it to be true, and and have seen similar adjacent studies that say, you know, if you're if you're afraid of making mistakes, you're going to take fewer creative liberties. Fewer things are going to fire off in your brain. You're going to have less access to the to that kind of the, the, all those temples of ideas. Um, I think I'm, I'm really really grateful, honestly, for my for, for my mother who. Who, no matter what educational system I was in, in some ways it, it went from the educational system to the, the music industry, and they're both as bizarre as each other, you know, yeah. in terms of prejudice and all sorts of um, things, and uh, you know, I, ideas and, and hard lines and disciplines, and then uncertainty and uh, all sorts of things. And you know, I end up on on different sides of the line for all those things. You know, certain things are perhaps easier for me as a as a white man, and other things are harder for me as a as a nonconformist in terms of genre, for example. But I think I'm very grateful for my mother for no matter where I was or what system I was in, sort of saying the the thing that really matters to me, as in to my mother, but also to me, is that the voice I'm using is my own voice mm. and that that comes from the, the, the right place. And I think that if there's one thing I'm most proud of in my career of the last 10 years, which is continuing and and, um, and ever evolving, I think I'm proud that I haven't lost any of that um, side of things. And I've I've never... Compromised the thing that feels right for me for, for the for the the kind like to, to win over somebody else's ideas of what's right and wrong and and some of that you can plan the the idealist the ideals that you can plan and the rest I, I just have to be grateful for the the components in my life that got me to 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 evolve to be that person if that makes sense. Um, I think the first time I, I I remember seeing you was the video of Pure Imagination. I may have seen it a year or two after it came out, but that video. You made, I think you were 16. Still, yeah, that's right. Still that's in right. high school. Mm. Um, and it's you singing Pure Imagination from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Beautiful song. Yeah. Um, and it's, for people who haven't seen it, it's multiple screens. And it's you um, harmonizing with yourself. And it's yeah. it's really beautiful and really complex. And I, oh, thank you. Um, and I wonder how how that came up. Because that would have, that really cha- changed your life. I mean, that set you off on a, career path that maybe you didn't anticipate yeah gosh it, we're, we're going back in time now a long time that's so that was 13 years ago yeah and i was obsessed with harmony you could say the, the the idea in music that you put notes together and you create narratives out of it like that's just oh what a cool idea i was obsessed and um you know you could say music is essentially at its simplest divided into three main 
kind of schools of thought or, or, or categories, one being rhythm and time, the second being melody and line, and the third being harmony and chords and relationships, you could say. In the world, harmony is the, the relationships between things. And and I loved it so much. And one of the best ways I had found by at that by that point to, to stretch myself was take a song that I love. So Pure Imagination is like one of the best songs ever written. It's just such a beautiful tune, as as you well know. Um, and I took that song for for a, for a ride in the Jacob Express, and wanted to see where I'd kind of where where it might land. So I I was kind of at that time especially, just like ravenous for. Um, to, to to surprise myself, honestly, to 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 go in unexpected directions, to create unexpected contexts. So, you know, that song, uh, which in essence is kind of, I mean, it's not the most simple of tunes, but it's quite repetitive. There's a form, you know, do 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 do. You hear that like six times by the end of the song, one time through. So it's 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 an easy recognizable tune. So I thought, okay, well, this is such a this song has such a strong identity. How can I create contrast and stretch myself and have fun and make this as beautiful as I can. So I, I really stretched it out and took it for a ride. And I mean, me at age 16, 17 was, was like, you know, wanting to, yeah, wanted to find the edge of all the things I understood. So, so I did, I did a rendition of that song. I think that my version was in five beats in a bar or five beats per measure, which essentially in, in a lot of music, you have songs in four. So, you know, Pure Imagination, inherently, the original is in four, as in do do one, two do three, four do one, two do 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 three, then four and one, you know. But mine was in five, so it was all choppy and junky. Do get to get, do get to get, you know, sort of jagged and irregular. And I loved all that stuff. It gave me such a such a thrill. Um, and so, yeah, I, I took that took that tune for a spin and I recorded all these different harmony parts of singing the bass and tenor and alto, soprano parts, whatever I was hearing, threw it into Logic, mixed it up, made a video, put it online. And I did that with a few different songs at that time. I remember doing a few Stevie Wonder songs and- I'm sure everybody was saying, yeah. Yeah, that, that, was, that, was a, that was a big moment for sure. A couple of Stevie Wonder, yeah, a couple of other Stevie Wonder songs besides. And there was a Michael Jackson song I did and some old jazz tunes. I was just like so interested, like what what's the furthest I can push? my 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 um experience of music and i wasn't particularly interested in building an audience or kicking off a career i was interested in how much fun can this be to create you know and and so i was kind of blo just completely blown away and taken by surprise when some of those videos began to kind of go a little bit bananas in the music communities around the world uh, because you know uh, it turns out there were other people in other countries of the world besides London who also loved chords and harmony and who kind of enjoyed and yeah. appreciated my my sort of irreverent harmonic experiments of sorts. And so I remember receiving an email from Quincy Jones. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> when I was about 18 years old, right when I really really don't even but I think it's crazy. I mean, yeah. I was absolutely certain that one of my mates was just pulling a, like a very well executed prank, you know, like, hey man, uh, Quincy Jones here, You're, you sound great. But the truth is it was the real Quincy Jones. Um, you know, speak of masters of the unexpected, masters of their craft, people who have who have belonged to and contributed to such a variety of different disciplines from big band arranging, trumpet playing, producing um, collaborations, crossing cultural boundaries, scoring for film, collaborating with all, some, some of the greatest artists of all yeah. time, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, it, it, the list, list is endless. So for me at that time, as, as just, you know, a kid in his room, literally this room I'm speaking to you from right now, it was the most profound feeling to for the world to shrink that fast. And it was kind of like, wow, so so now Quincy Jones is just like one Gmail click away. And that's- it's amazing. That's amazing. And and um, and kind of never, you know, never never gets old. And I remember flying, I took a flight to Montreux in Switzerland uh, to the Montreux Jazz Festival, which is one of the most legendary music festivals of all time that Quincy helped to found in the 60s. And Quincy kind of goes every year and he, he's like the king of the castle. I remember going to Montreux by myself. It's my first ever plane ride by myself. And um, and I, I went to meet the great man and shake his hand and we hung out all night. He was telling stories of hanging out with Picasso and Stravinsky and Bernstein and all this just in, just insane stories. And I think I think for me it was it was just such a moment of of recognizing how like it didn't matter how old you were or how experienced you were or how famous you were, either you had that that creative spark and that bug that you got like oh man. I'm so interested in the world. I want to understand the world. I want to contribute to the world. I want to learn. Mm. Or you didn't have that bug. And it's just kind of like one of those things. And I, I just, 
like I forgot that I mean Quincy now is 90 years old but at that time he was I think 81 and I forgot he was 81 I thought he was and I forgot that I was 19 you know I I, I just felt like we were two people hanging out and nerding out over interesting spiky chords and it was just a beautiful moment you know you this idea of of curiosity and creativity and and there's a, and you mentioned this idea that you 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 have the spark and you pursue it or you don't but i wonder whether you think that that spark is like you know something that falls from the sky or mm. it's something that you can see that somebody could pursue it's a f fantastic question i i i do believe that what if i if i were to think about how how do i define you know life force you could say how do you measure life force or um vitality or even consciousness i think i think that is what i think that is what that is i think everybody inherently has in them something that wants to live desperately i want to live i want to see the world i want to smell the world i want to taste the world everything i think if if that force did not exist in in, in a person then they wouldn't be they wouldn't be alive and and I feel like there's never a point where it's too late to kindle that force. That's one thing I do believe. Um, mm. All of us as human beings, I think the force comes it go, goes up and down over time. I can think of moments where I was just turned on by everything in the world. It was like, oh my word, I just want to live so hard. This is crazy. And then other moments where, you know, I kind of needed to 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 absorb more energy and rekindle and take time, and that's that's all part of the journey. But I, I think that, you know, I think that yeah, there's something beautiful about being here on this planet for no apparent reason, um, without instructions, <laughs> there's no manual. You just kind of go out and and be you. And, uh, and you know, I, I often think about what I have the privilege of doing for a living, which is essentially being really fascinated for a living. Um, I, I wonder if you'd feel the same, but I think the, the idea that you get to continuously open your mind to new things is, is amazing. I do think you can cultivate the spark. I think you can yeah. learn it. Um, I think it's a bit like, yeah, I, I think a lot about this idea of almost like internal weather. You know how when you wake up in the morning, you open the, the blinds, it's like, hey, oh, okay, today's cloudy and there's a bit of sun and it's kind of cold, but there's no wind, you know. And every day has, has a different set of parameters uh, that, w with which you can determine how you want to do how you want to do your day. You know, so say, for example, you're a surfer, like a, a good friend of mine is an avid surfer and so he'll obsessively check the, the the weather and the waves every morning. Like, okay, the the the, um, the tides up this amount, and then the surf's about this high, and the wind is this amount, and whatever. And he'll he'll he will learn the conditions, the external conditions, needed for him to be the best surfer he can on that day. And there is an amount that's like you, you need to show up and surf no matter what. And then there's an amount that's like you need to ride the wave no matter what it is. And I, I think about this internally a lot of the time as someone who performs and, and creates and composes and all such things. Because I think that my job is, in a sense, it's, it's the same thing, but internally and externally at mm. times. It's to observe the conditions that I find myself in, no matter what they may be. And, you know, some, sometimes the conditions are perfect and sometimes the conditions are really hard. Um, life is very, very unpredictable. But I think that the, the job of an artist and the beauty of, of the job of an artist is to 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 um, garner a skill set which is capable of alchemizing the world as they see it, no matter what that world may be, and pursue the science of presenting that world in a way that that kind of increases that spark in 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 the, in the artist's own heart and in the hearts of the people that the artist is is reaching. And I think that there's there's a there's an art and a science to listening to yourself and, and observing yourself and, and observing the world and and learning to recognize sparks in people and and ha and how to, how to grow them um I, one, one thing one thing I'll say a, a, about a spark I think that I've learned is I've I've almost learned more about cultivating sparks in people I love than in myself at times yeah. so you know if I see say say for example you know my my sister say my sister's going through something tough um and she's kind of lost the spark, but I know my sister. I know there's the spark in there. I know I know how that spark can come about. It's like my job as her friend and her brother is to is to learn to re, it's like to remind her of her own spark so that she may find it for herself and explore it. And sometimes I feel like I have to be that friend to myself, uh, but the spark never really goes away. Yeah, I'm curious about 
about sort of on this thread of of hard hard things, right? And how you cope with them. And I I, I it's a bit of a digression from from what I intended to ask you, but I remember when I saw you on stage in 2017. Um, and even now, there is a sort of an optimism about the way you present yourself. There's a a a, a kindness, a humility, a sort of this positive energy. And I know that all of us, you know, when we're we're doing a podcast, we're talking to the public, and we all we all present the best version of ourselves. We have to. But I really felt that that was who you are. And I, and not to say that we don't, we shouldn't have other sides to ourselves. We should. But I know that you didn't have a super easy childhood. You didn't grow up with your dad. He wasn't around, for example. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And yet there's this kind of brightness or sunniness. Like even this thing that you said about opening up the blinds and looking out and saying, okay, it's cloudy today. Like I, I don't always do that. I open the blinds and I'm like, oh, it's cloudy today. And I, <laughs> I wonder if you have to fight to be optimistic and mm. positive or does it is it something that's easy for you? Mm. That's a really beautiful question. Um, I, I definitely have those days where I open up the blinds and it's like, are you kidding me? It's cloudy again. I'm just going to stay in bed. You know, I I don't bound around about the house like a mad chicken feeling glad all the time. Um, I, I think that, I think you can, uh, what, one thing I do believe is that you you do create the world. And how can I, how can I put this? Everything is true, you could say. You, everything you ever believe, you will find evidence for being true. Um, if you if you decide, for example, that the world's going to end and everything is kind of doomed, and you know, uh, you know, people, yeah, people, people aren't very nice, and actually, who am I to judge anyway? And I don't know who I am, and maybe nothing I've done is worth it. And, you know, all these kinds of things. If you if you give your attention to, to those thoughts, they they become true, and That's I know right. this. Just from That's experience, right. I know it because when I go down those little tirades, it's not fun, and it's extremely pervasive. Um, and I think you know one thing about being a person who creates things in the world. I think is that to do my job well, I have to be sensitive to the world, and I, and I have to have an, an, an antenna which is attuned to the world, and that makes me even more vulnerable in some ways to some of those feelings than than, than others. Um, I I would also say you know if you say yeah if if I if I say you know, everybody is trying, everybody is loving in their way. Um, or everybody, or, you know, there's there, like, there's, there, there's always, there's always something to live for. Or, um, yeah, it's like, there's a, there's a version of, there's a version of, of reality that you get, you're in charge of it. You get to decide what it is. But th the thing that I, I forget sometimes is that I am, in, that I am in, in charge of it. Um, because sometimes you forget that you get to decide like there aren't that many things in life you really get to decide. I think there are two things you really get to decide. One is how you spend your time and the other is where you put your attention. And that literally defines your entire life. Like those two things define everything for you. Um, so you can open the blinds and look at the cloudy sky and see two completely different skies based on what you decide to be true and what you decide to matter. Um, and I think sometimes it does take a little bit of practice, you know, and, and you can't just expect yourself to show up and be the greatest version of yourself every day. I think that one of the interesting things about being the, an artist is that if I if I made cheery music all the time that was like affable and great, and that was the only thing I was tapping into, then I wouldn't be doing my best work necessarily. Um, I think that you know the, the job of an artist is to dig into all the different nooks and crannies of what makes them tick and be honest about how it all feels. And some of that is a bit dark and weird. And and um, if you do it right, then people in the world who experience those things too will feel like they're not alone. Um, but, you know, yeah, you, you mentioned my, my father and, and growing up, I think was interesting for me because I had two extremely different parents from each other. You know, my mother is extremely open, giving, kind of phosphoric, bright, guiding light person. And my father's, you know, more, more complicated, more fearful, um, also more kind of liturgical in certain ways. And, and you know, in a sense, ha had more of a sort of disciplinarian approach. And so... I think part of it for me, which I'm grateful for when I observe myself looking back, is that I was able to kind of uh, reverse engineer a sense of, it's almost like a, like a determination um, to to combine the worlds that I saw 
and it, it it does like when you when there's when there's one parent figure who's either absent and so many people probably listening right now can relate to this in some way but you know if you have an absent parent there is it's it's a wound that's hard to heal um and there is a little bit of a fire i think in my belly as a creative person that's like i'm going to do it i'm going to really do it i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to create with the world no matter what the world throws at me i'm going to i'm going to make it work you know and there, there's like a there's a kind of determination that I feel I owe to that way of having been brought up, um, either directly or indirectly. I think that that's part of what makes me me. And in a sense, I think as being a human being on planet Earth, you can't avoid discomfort. You can't avoid pain and struggle. Um, and and I think in, in a sense that the moment where you say, I'm going to embrace the struggles I have had and, 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 incorp- and, and so incorporate them in my story rather than try and blot them out as, as I would try and blot out a cloud in the sky. Like, oh no, I don't want to see the cloud. I only want to see the sunshine, please, only sunshine. If, if you're able to tap in and, and say, okay, cool. So there's a, there's a, there's a massive storm and then, there's, and then there's a wind, but then tomorrow it's going to be sunny. And then, but then there'll be this and that. The other. If you're able to look at the world unintimidated by struggle, and say, I'm going to ride this wave. I'm I'm a good surfer. Like I, I know myself. I'm going to I'm going to buckle up and make and just make the best of this. Um, that I think is that I think is me when I'm at my best. And I think it's humanity when it's when it's at its best. And and the joy of that process is not that it ends up just simply giving you purpose, but it actually it gives so many people around you purpose and courage and permission to feel all of what life throws at you and for all of it to be valid, all of it to be important and okay and and cool in, in a sense to to experience and and not just to filter out the the to, you know only take the the good stuff if that makes sense. How, how did you, how were you able to? I mean, your sort of the first few years of your public life were mm. um, a series of these really beautiful videos. Many of them of you harmonizing, like the Flintstones theme song. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And and they just you know a lot of these went viral and have had millions and millions of, of views. To the point where, of course, you were approached by record labels to 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 start to make music. And when you started to make your own music, because your first album came out in 2015 in my room, did you were the expectations that you felt from the let's say the the music industry were the expectations for you to be that same kind of artist, like do these acapella things and like that's who you're going to be, hmm. or and and was that okay with you if that was the expectation? I remember the first meetings I took with record labels, uh, qu- quite fondly actually, um, and not not that I ended up signing with, with any of the record labels or was it was interested in doing that necessarily. But I I, I enjoyed the process. I, I remember I met with a label 2013, so I was like really really young. I think I just maybe just turned 19, mm-hmm. kind of when everything was kicking off, and I. I, I brought a bunch of demos to play them, and it was a mixture of you know a mixture of stuff. It was like some acapella things, it was some like rock and roll stuff, and it was some jazz and improvisation and folk and electronic, and it was like like every genre was present in some way, shape, or form. And I remember playing this demos to the people, so you know, cheery faced and being like, "Hey guys, let me play you my demos." And these guys just scratching their heads and being like, "You know, we we know there's something going on here that's really special, but." we don't know what on earth to do with you. Like, what do we do? <laughs> um, we can't market you as jazz. We can't market you as folk or classical. We can't market you as pop. And, and we can't really market you as alternative because it's, it's not like... So So we just kind of... They kind of shrugged their shoulders like with, with respect to what I was doing. They kind of said, look, we just don't know what to do. Um, and, and in the end, one of the labels ended up giving me a, a, little, a little budget. Like, I think it was like five grand or something. Um, which was just so amazing at that time for me to to think, oh man, okay, so I can I can upgrade my SM58, you know, I get get a couple of other things, I can get a, a set of speakers, I can do whatever, and they gave me this this little budget to go and make some make some more demos and come back in a year with you know, no strings attached, and um, I was really really very grateful for that time um, because I didn't know what I wanted to do yet, and I wanted to figure it out on my own terms. The one thing I did know was I wasn't going to be I wasn't going to kind of churn out like pop songs. I just wasn't interested. It wasn't interesting enough to me. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to, I definitely wanted to explore with the acapella, the acapella mm-hmm. harmony stuff for a while. And I, I did, I did at that time. And I also wanted to kind of expand my, my multi-instrumental thing to include some other instruments. I wanted to start 
exploring the idea of a one-man show. All these things were on the horizon. Um, and I, I think, in, in a sense, the, the pressure I think I, I felt in the early days as things started to grow and pick up steam wasn't so much from the labels who, who just didn't really they just didn't really know what to do. Uh-huh. I think it was I think it was partly from my audience, but most of all, I think it was from me because I think yeah. I felt this sense of like, oh, I really, I really know that there's some, there's like there's something I, that I have in me that I need to make exist because if I don't do it, it's gonna like weigh on me forever. Like I need to, if I don't create this stuff, I'm gonna like not be not be okay. Like I have to I have to create this stuff, and and that itself is pressure. I think I think my early a lot of my early supporters really loved the acapella stuff. And there was, there was a sort of cohort of them that were like, when I started to go off that track, they were like, hey man, you know, we, you know, we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't want you to be doing this other stuff. We want you to be making acapella harmonization videos forever, you know? Yeah. And then, then I went and did the one man show and there were, and, and then when, I remember when I moved on from the one man show to have a band, there were people like, man, you know, you've just lost the plot, you know, you're the one man show guy. Don't you, don't you realize like that's your, that's where your value is. And then I remember when I, you know, I made I made that first album in my room, and and then there were people. And you made who, it in your room, literally. I made it in this very in this very room, and and I yeah I remember some people think oh this isn't like the old stuff I don't know about this, and then there were some people who thought this is this is the future of what we want, and then I did the next album, the next album, and I think I think you know there's always people no matter who you are in this world I'm sure you would attest to this too there are always people who don't quite feel they can identify with the direction you're taking at any one time they don't want you to evolve or. Or they 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 they'd rather they'd rather you were the version of of you that they liked. <laughs> it seems such a simple thing to say, but it's like sometimes I have to I have to remind myself. It's like, well, you know, sorry, I'm not the version of you that you want me to be. Like I'm me instead, and that's actually all I can be, and that's okay. And I think that goes for anyone in this world. Um, I think one thing I'm proud of ten years on from that time period is how. The, the the how vast the majority is of my followers and fans who show up for whatever version of myself I want to be <laughs> any one time. If anything, the thing that they hold me to the most is Jacob will definitely surprise us next. And if he doesn't surprise us, then he's doing it wrong. You know, then he's not being Jacob. Like he needs to, he needs to surprise us, which is a funny paradox because I think a lot of audiences are made are built from people who don't want artists to ever change. Please just make this one album again and again and again. And and for me, I think if I made an album again. I'd I'd be betraying <laughs> be betraying my core fans who who know me as as a kind of chameleon of of sorts. Um, there's also immense value and and depth and learning that you can that you can gather from doing the same thing again and again. Uh, but I think my life is is a funny combination of that kind of structure and that and that chaos in a sense. You know, you mentioned David Byrne earlier, and if you think about like the trajectory of his career, right? I mean, yeah. doing Talking Heads, punk music, songs about buildings and food and fear of music and stop making sense to them a career with you know ray momo and all these you know brazilian influences and and obviously african influences but yeah. the sounds that he's produced and then you know writing a broadway musical about imelda marcos i mean the things that he's done and the variety of work that he's done the breath is you know it's breathtaking right it, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, gorgeous it's amazing it's a massive yeah. range and here you are you are Barely thirty years old. I think. I think you'll turn thirty this year. True. And um, you, you know, you kind of started out as this acapella YouTuber, and obviously you have changed what you do and want to change what you do. And and in the last several years, you've been working with a lot of different musicians um, on these this series of albums that you've you put out. Pronounced Jesse, I think. Jesse is correct. Jesse, absolutely. Right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nice DJ one. DJ E S S E. Yeah, right. Um, and so I wonder how you think about pushing the boundaries. You know, do you, is it, is it, is it just serendipitous? Is it just happen that you're like, oh, this sounds cool. Let me try this. And then you start moving in a completely different direction. Or do you, do you try things? Do you actively seek out things that seem challenging to, that, that you might not be comfortable working with or sounding like? Yeah, I think. It's definitely a combination of those two things. I mean, I, I look at these titans, people like David Byrne, Quincy Jones is another one, um, Leonard Bernstein is a great example, Stravinsky is another good, good example, Herbie Hancock, you could argue, um, Sting is another. It's just these people who kind of continuously reinvented themselves um, to change with the times, to change with their own fascinations, to evolve alongside the relationships 
and friendships and collaborations that meant a lot to them at, that, at the t different times in their life. And, and I've also had the privilege of hanging out with some of these people and asking them, when you were 29, what were you thinking about the future? How much had you planned out? And, and overarchingly, I think that the, the resounding answer I've got from so many people that I, that I respect uh, is, I mean, Quincy, Quincy says this, Quincy has a saying that he says a lot, which is like, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, right? So this idea that, you know, you can, you can, there's this illusion you, that you can ordain the rest of your life. Oh man, I know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to score a film and write a book. and I'm going to have a hit record and go on tour and it's going to be freaking amazing. And those things may happen. They may not happen. If they happen, they won't be by my design. <laughs> That's one thing I know for, for, for certain. Um, I think that probably, but between the two forces that you stated, one being the sort of serendipity and, and one being the more conscious kind of building efforts, I would say that it's probably, for me personally, I think that it's more the serendipity than anything else. Uh, but my job then in the serendipity, rather than just burying my head in the sand and waiting for something to happen, is to make myself available to, to the universe. It, you know, sounds a bit cosmic, but it's kind of like, I need to make sure there's space in my life, time in my life, energy to spare, the right kinds of uh, friendships, the right kind of um, relationships and collaborative components and team members and all these kinds of things in my life so that I can show up and be spontaneous every day in, in, in good faith and know that I'll be led uh, in, in, in the right direction. And, and fundamentally, you know, if I look back at the last 10 years, it's it's such a mixture because, you know, some things, a lot of things come out, fall out, fall out of the sky into your lap. You think, well, how yeah. in the world did that end up being my life? What, you know? And then there are other things that you that you really consciously do think about and plan. So, you know, this, this album series that I've been working on, Jesse, volume one, two, three, and now volume four, was was in some regards very consciously designed and in others totally chaotic. You know, I wanted to, this was after In My Room was finished, I'd finished the one-man show tour and I was thinking, I want to, man, I not only do I want to collaborate, but I need to collaborate with some musicians now. You were alone, now. you were playing all the instruments on stage. I, yeah, and whilst that was a joy, I was like, I'm, I'm not going to evolve, I'm not going to evolve as a person and a musician enough uh, in the ways that I want to, unless I find a way of, of collaborating with, with a musician. So I thought, well, I'm not just going to collaborate with a few people. I want to collaborate with everybody in the world. You know, it's a very sort of J J J Jacobian construct there. But I remember making a list of, yeah, 50, 60 musicians that I loved and who were alive. Um, and the, the broadly designing the, the idea for the album where volume one was going to be this kind of orchestral album. Volume two was more of a folk-based album. Volume three was more of a kind of R&B and electronic sounds-based album. And volume four was question mark, question mark, question mark. I'll figure it out when I get there. And and then this list of collaborators and, and some demos. And the, the thing that I find extraordinary is how many of those people are on the album. Um, and, you know, you think, well, every every one of those collaborations, in a sense, was serendipitous in some way. You know, they DM'd me out of the blue, or I ended up backstage with them at a show, or we bumped into each other on the street, or whatever it happened to be, or all the things. But but simultaneously to it being serendipitous, I also kind of manifested it by th by imagining the feeling of having it before I, I had it. It was like, oh, what would it feel like if I had, like, yeah, Stormzy on my album? That would be crazy. That would be insane. Or how would it feel to have John Mayer or how would it feel to have Take Six or Jojo or, or any of these people? Um, and you know, some of these people are really well known, and some of these people are virtually unknown um, to the to the wider you know music world. But I, I loved them all equally, and I I sought that feeling. And um, I think yeah, I think I, I I marvel now looking back at the whole process at the the staggering list of people that I, it's just like uh, yeah. wow, you know. And, and I I could never have planned it but i also did kind of plan it's it's a, it's a, it's a fun, funny balance how do you write for like let's just use an example t-pain who, who, who was on yeah. on your last record like are you like you're writing and arranging all of this music i mean not just not just performing on them but you are arranging this stuff and are also producing it as well i am yeah so i think uh, that was that, that was the bit I knew I really was the most kind of excited and, and slightly terrified of was, you know, I, I'm, I'm producing this, these four albums by myself. So it's, it's literally just me in this exact chair, looking at this exact screen, clicking and dragging till the cows come home. And, and there's no one else to be like, hey, you know, you could do that like this. It's just me. So, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I knew it would be interesting and it's been such, such a challenge in so many ways. But T-Pain's a great example. You know, T-Pain's world, 
I have delighted in for many years, as we all have. You know, he's brilliant. He's got such a crack and sense of humor. He doesn't take himself too seriously, but he's also like really amazing. I don't know if you've seen his NPR Tiny Desk concert, but he's a really, really great singer. Yeah. So his ears are wide open. Um, he followed me on Instagram at one point, and I was kind of like, man, T-Pain just followed me. This is crazy. I have a song right now with Jesse Reyes, and I and I need a, a hook, like a kind of like anthemic hook. And like, if there was one guy in, in the world I would think to, that could provide this, maybe it's T, honestly, it's T-Pain. Like, let's just ask him. So I, I, I messaged him like, hey, T-Pain, man, like, what's up? You know, he was like, oh, Jacob, and I'm, I'm, I'm such a fan, whatever. And I was just so blown away. And so we FaceTimed and I was like, man, I've got this this tune called Count the People. And, you know, there's this drumline br- breakout where it's like, and I want a hook that's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, something, 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 something. And I was like, what do you think, T-Pain? And he was like, man, I'm free this evening, just like le- le- leave it with me. So I left it with him. <laughs> I left it with T-Pain for the night. And, you know, at about 5 a.m. that night, I got a FaceTime back and it was T-Pain in his studio, bopping around, like blasting this thing. And he'd, he'd, he'd written this hook along the, the lines that I'd, that I'd like the wow. criteria that I'd said, and he just crushed it. It was so amazing. And, um, you know, that, that whole record, Jesse Volume 3, was so interesting because so much of it was done in lockdown. It was not done in person. So, you know, I remember mailing a microphone to um, Kiana Lede and mailing a microphone to Mahalia and like talking through on FaceTime, I remember with Kiana saying, okay, so so you plug you plug the audio interface in with this USB-C cable on this side, and then you'd like have to install this driver. And then <laughs> I was like remote, you know, remote desktoping to control her screen and stuff and and engineering her session from home. And so that whole process of collaboration, like virtual collaboration, is is insanely interesting to me. And it was a very a very interesting time and and different from all the in-person sessions. So, you know, for example, writing music for an orchestra, which I've done for Jesse Volume One and now also Jesse Volume Four, and and that's literally me with the manuscript paper, like writing out every note for every instrument. You know, piccolo, bassoon, French horn, all this stuff. And I haven't got training really. I don't have. I haven't been trained to orchestrate this stuff. I just love orchestral music and and have the have the nerve <laughs> to try to reverse engineer it. And 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 you know, being in the in the room with an orchestra and 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 kind of discerning what you like and what you don't like was amazing. Uh, one fun thing about Jesse Volume 4 is that my mum actually conducted the orchestra on the record, which I just loved that process because we got to be like co-conspirators wow. in and around that side of the collaboration, which is very cool. But, you know, so different from T-Pain, which is, which is so different from Chris Martin, which is so different from a- a- anybody else. That Everyone is his own island of kind of wonder and learning. And, and so Jesse Volume 4, um, this record is about, and you described it as that it's being about the human voice. And not just a few voices. I mean, all your records are about the human voice, but like mass scale human voice, like yeah. tens of thousands of people. Can you explain what what that is, how you do that? Yeah. So one of the things that I loved most about the most recent world tour I did, which is 2022 to 2023, um, we played about 150 shows all across the world. Um, one of the things I delighted in the most was something that, evolved over time to be what I now think of as the audience choir, the idea of the audience choir. And um, it's, you know, it's, it was, it began as a, as an experiment. It's, it's, it's still an experiment. There's nothing particularly defined about it. Um, but the idea is, you know, audiences always, I think audiences always know more than you think they, they know. <laughs> um, and all they normally need is just permission. So I, I like to give my, my audiences a ton of permission just to get involved, call and response, you know, Sing it back, sing it, you know, harmonize, whatever, do whatever you want. And, and people tend to muck in and do things. And there's something that happened once in, I think it was actually, it's where you are. It's in San Francisco. There's a venue called August Hall. I don't know if you know that venue. But um, I played that venue in 2019, so a while ago now. And uh, and at the very end of the show, I was playing an encore. And, and the final, I, the, I was, I think I was playing Blackbird by the Beatles. I think that was, I always loved playing that tune live. And and I, I got to the end of the song and the final chord of the song, I was in the key of F. So the final chord of the song was F major. And I played F major and the crowd went, Rawr, and they, they sang they sang the F major. And I thought, this is beautiful. You know, like what an amazing, what an amazing sound. And I, I remember they, like they sang it and I stopped playing and they, and they kept singing it. So I stood up from the piano and I walked to the front of the stage and I just kind of looked at them and they were going, oh, you know, and... And then I thought, okay, well, if, if I give if I give you this note, this note, this note, then I, I I split the room into three parts basically, 
And I started to point up and down to different parts of the audience. And to my absolute amazement, they all moved the note up and down wow. as, as though I told them what note to sing, but I didn't tell them. They just knew. They knew inherently. And that moment will, for me, go down in history as a, a kind of a bit of a life-changing moment for me because I, I recognized so much at that moment. Um, I recognized that me at my greatest is bigger than me. That's one thing I realized. Um, I also realized that all people normally need is just a chance, <laughs> you know, give, give, give them a chance and they will provide something of value. Um, and, and also that I was on the edge of a world of discovery that felt a little bit untapped, which is really exciting. And I'd, I've seen people do call and response stuff with the audience. There's that amazing Freddie Mercury video from 1985, Live, Live Aid, where he does that legendary call and response with 100,000 people. And um, I also used to like pour over videos of Bobby McFerrin in the 80s mm. doing his one man show and all the spontaneous inventions, all of that stuff, which I just love so much. And But I'd never seen someone play an audience polyphonically before, which is to say multiple notes moving in different directions at one time. So from that moment to kind of the present moment now, I've, I've been expanding on that language. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the kind of musical territory I've found myself in has blown my mind. Um, and it's just the most extraordinary feeling to go all over the world and to conduct these audience choirs. And I'm improvising every night. You know, I don't have a, a particular route through the chords that I know I always want to do. I'm constantly trying new things up and down. We could go here, we could go here, trying to change key and all this stuff without saying a word. Um, the, the, I think the biggest challenge last year was Glastonbury. I played at Glastonbury for the first time. 30,000 mm -hmm. people came. And... Um, I thought, well, I know that I, only have, I only have an hour set, and if I go one minute over, they're gonna cut the feed to TV. But I wanted to try two minutes of audience choir, so I did it, and it worked at Glastonbury. And that- And that's that, outdoors. That's outdoors, so there's no yeah. reverberation. Um, that is not musicians, it's just a bunch of plebs, you know, who are, who are there, like just amazing, well-meaning audience members, but who aren't necessarily musically inclined. And it was just an amazing experience to, be enlivened by that. So what I started to do, to cut a long story short, was to record the audiences at every one of my shows. And out of all those recordings, hundreds and hundreds of recordings, I, I amassed a choir, a 150,000 voice choir, wow. which sings on Jesse Volume 4 throughout the album on different songs. So anytime you hear a choir singing, it's probably an audience of 5,000, you know? <laughs> um, and I, the first song on the album, which is called 100,000 Voices, literally has 100,000 voices on it. Um, and I can't describe the sound of it. It's, it's like a, it's like a, a wall of humanity. It's like this, it's, it's, it's an enormous tidal wave of like, just like joy, really, enthusiasm and joy. And, and, and so, as I, as I described, I've been waiting for the Jesse Volume 4 kind of, um, kind of like, like Apple to fall. It's like, what's this album? What's this album really about? You know, I've, I've explored all these genres, one, two, three, what's this album all about? And I realized with the audience choirs, this album is about the human voice. And it's about the power of everybody in the world having a voice, using a voice, the courage to express with a voice and, and the communal power of the voice as well, the power of, of voices en masse. And then I thought back to my earliest beginnings as a musician, sitting in this room with my little SM58, layering my own voice on top of itself time and time again, kind of seeking exactly the same thing, which is harmony with between voices. The idea that, you know, a, a person can be more of themselves. Um, the, the idea that somewhere out there beyond the four walls of this room are is a whole world of people who who are seeking connection, who want to give connection. And, and, and somehow, and again, this is, you, you could say I planned it, but in truth, I think I just walked the path and saw what happened. But I've ended up right where I started in my career, which is, which is wide open to what music can offer me as a human, and deeply in love with the potential of the human voice. Um, it's amazing, and and as as Quincy Jones once told you, you can't plan for what's going to come next. You just have no idea. Exactly, exactly. And I still have no idea. I still don't know what's going to come. Next, I, you know, who knows where I'll be in a year's time or two years time or five years time or whatever. But um, I, yeah, I think if there's anything I've learned now and not just within the world of music, but just in the, in the world full stop, it's like you, you, you just give without holding back. You know, if you, if, if you, if there's something you've got to give, you just give it and it's only in giving it that you can, that you can get back. And so I think I've just, I've, I've become accustomed to 
that joy and that's it like it like that that's the one rule i want to live by i i don't there aren't really any other rules i want to live by but i do want to keep giving and i want to keep learning um that just kind of feels like the thing and you you look at someone like quincy and you think that man is still learning you know he's yep. still open to the world and that's a that's such a gift i want to be as cool as quincy when i'm 90 and still be figuring out stuff you know yeah jacob collier thank you so much thank you thank you for having me for sure Hey, thanks so much for watching my conversation with Jacob Collier. His new record is called Jesse Volume 4. We'll include some links to some of his best music videos at our show notes. You can find those at thegreatcreators.com slash Collier. There you can also find tons of interviews with people like Tom Hanks and Ellie Goulding and Jeff Tweedy and Bjork and so many other amazing people. You can also find this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Great Creators and please make sure to click the follow button on your podcast app so you never miss a new episode. And also... If you get a chance, please hit subscribe so you never miss a new episode of our video version of the show. Thanks again for watching. I'm Guy Raz. You've been watching The Great Creators, and we'll be back here next week with another conversation.